Hon Yu, Hon Yu Liu, <laughs> and he's going to tell us about fundamental limitation on the detectability of entanglement. Yes, the floor is yours, please. Hello. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Peng Yu Liu from Tsinghua University, and today I'm going to talk about the fundamental limitation on the detectability of entanglement. This work is based on joint collaboration with Zheng Fan Liu, Shu Chen, and Professor Xiong Fengma. So uh, we begin with a brief introduction to quantum entanglement. In the context of bipartite systems, a state rho is said to be separable if it can be expressed as a separable form. A summation of rho A tends to rho B, otherwise it is entangled. We use SCP and ENT to denote the set of separable states and entangled states. Entanglement cannot be directly measured, and we need some clever methods to determine whether a state is entangled or not. This is called entanglement detection, and the method is called entanglement detection criterion or protocol. Uh, the simplest uh, entanglement criterion is entanglement witnesses. An uh, entanglement witness operator denoted as W satisfies the condition that its expectation value is positive for all separable states. <coughs> And if an entanglement witness has a negative expectation, we know that rho must be uh, entangled. However, if we have a positive expectation, actually we have uh, no idea about the state and we have no conclusion. Throughout this talk, uh, we only consider this kind of no false positive criterion that you never classify a separable state as entangled, but must fail to find some entangled states. Most well-known entanglement criteria satisfy this property. And uh, before diving into our work, let's briefly review the history of entanglement detection. Uh, entanglement witnesses are initially used, but considered too weak. Uh, as we will show, it's double exponentially weak. Uh, so to detect entanglement more effectively, we need some nonlinear criteria that has no direct experimental access. Before 2000, entanglement detection was not viewed as an independent task. It was done through two steps. First, we have some math criteria, like uh, the positive partial transpose criteria that requires you to have all the elements of the density matrix, and we have state tomography to get all the required information. But entanglement or not, it's just one bit of information, and we should uh, be able to do much better than this brute force method. After that, researchers developed some methods to avoid state tomography. But this method still requires uh, mirroring some high order moment of the state, uh, which is uh, which requires you to prepare the state simultaneously, uh, which is still difficult. Uh, this year, uh, with the development of NISC devices, we are interested in performing entanglement detection experiments on those devices. However, NISC devices has limited capability, and it can process one copy of the state at a time, and only values like trace O rho can be accessible, but uh, values like trace O rho tensor rho or trace rho square cannot. Uh, as a result, we began to focus on entanglement criteria that only require single copy measurements and try to minimize the experimental cost. That is the number of measurements you need. Uh, however, after all this work, we found that none of them is fully satisfactory. Uh, they either cannot detect much entangled or they cost too much. This is even more interesting if we consider the following fact. For a d-dimensional random state coupled with a k-dimensional environment, and we will define this formally later. When k is not too large, entanglement exists almost surely. However, effective entanglement criteria usually requires uh, exponential resources, and efficient entanglement criteria often perform fully uh, without prior knowledge, that is, if the state is completely random to you. Uh, here, effective means powerful. If the state is entangled with high probability, uh, the criteria should tell me that it is entangled. And efficient means that it is resource saving and does not require lots of number, uh, a lot of measurements. As we are talking about probability, we need some kind of distribution. Note that the density matrix does not have a natural distribution uh, since it lacks a group structure. So we define this k-induced density matrix. A set row following the distribution pi dk can be generated by tracing out the environment system of a hard measured random pure state H. Uh, in H tensor HR, uh, where HR is an environment with dimension K and H is a bipartite system that we are interested in with dimension D. This definition has very strong physical implication. 
The system we are interested in is coupled with an environment we have no control, and they have interacted for a long enough time so that the whole system is in a random pure state. So the systems that we consider can be generated by tracing all the environments. With, a, uh, with this uh, distribution in hand, we can easily define the capability of some inherent criteria. It is simply the probability of a successful detection. So for the entanglement witness, it's just a probability of having a negative expectation value. Okay, so now we can present our main theorem, uh, which establishes a trade-off between the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, entanglement detection. So consider a random state coupled to a k-dimensional environment that is our pi dk distribution, and any entanglement criteria that can be verified with m single copy observables the criterion is either inefficient or ineffective. Inefficient means that it requires uh, almost linearly with k observables to verify, and ineffective means that it can detect entanglement successfully with probability exponentially decays with k even if the state is entangled. So <clears throat> also this theorem can tell us that uh, by using multi-copy environments, we can have some advantage uh, consider a state following pi d squared d distribution and dA equals to dB equals to d. Uh, so basically we have three parts of the system, A, B, C, and C is the environment, and uh, all of them are symmetric. So uh, with only single copy environments, we need uh, d over log d observables for a successful uh, detection with probability 0 0.5 uh, according to our theorem. However, if we have two copy measurements, we need only one observable for successful uh, detection with probability larger than 0 0.5. Uh, the proof is very straightforward. We can use a purity criterion. Uh, the purity criterion tells us the state is entangled if the purity of one part is smaller than the whole system. Notice that ABC forms a pure system, so the purity of AB equals to the purity of C. Uh, and AC are symmetric, so their purity has the same distribution. So equation five here uh, are satisfied with probability 0 0.5. Okay, uh, here's our, all the theorems and the corollaries, and now let's uh, begin our proof. Uh, so here I show some uh, overview for our proof, and it contains four stages. Uh, in each stage, we uh, bound the detection capability of some kind of uh, uh, entanglement detection criteria from the uh, simplest uh, single entanglement witness to multiple entanglement witnesses to uh, infinitely many entanglement witnesses, and finally we bound the detection capability of any single copy criterion. Okay, now let's start with the simplest case, a single entanglement witness. Uh, the detection capability is defined as uh, previous, uh, the probability of having a negative uh, expectation value. <coughs> We prove that uh, its detection capability exponentially decreases with k, and different witness has a uh, different constant before k. Uh, okay, so here let's see some examples. We have two types of entanglement witnesses, uh, one from the PBT criterion and one based on fidelity. The fidelity-based entanglement witnesses, uh, or the faithful entanglement witness here, uh, says that if the state is close to a maximally entangled state here, uh, I use phi to denote that, uh, so uh, the state will be entangled. So we can see that the PBT type of entanglement witness is kind of optimal since it has the smallest possible alpha, one, uh, which gives you the lowest decreasing speed. And the fifth one is really, really bad because it also decreases exponentially with D. Uh, as shown in the red figure, uh, the PBT criteria re uh, uh, remains stable while the uh, faithful criteria will decrease. And from the left figure, you can see that the PBT criteria has a slope independent with D, and the faithful entanglement witness has a higher slope when D increases. Uh, the strict proof requires a lot of calculation, so here we uh, only show an intuitive illustration. As you can see, we have three balls here in the density matrix space, and the outer one contains all the state, and the maximum mixed state with uh, purity one over D, that's in the middle of the figure, uh, denoted with the star. Uh, it is shown that all state with a distance to the maxi maximally mixed state approximately smaller than one over D 
are separable, which is represented as an inner ball. With the st uh, state distribution pi dk, the expected purity can be approximated by 1 over d plus 1 over k. As a result, the state distribution will concentrate in the typical set with r prime uh, approximately uh, equals to 1 over square root of k, also centered at the maximally mixed state as a middle ball. So outside the typical set uh, are the sparse area where the distribution is too sparse that we can uh, simply ignore the state. And inside the typical set, we uh, simply assume the state is uniformly distributed. So uh, that's our uh, approximation. Now let's detect the di entanglement with uh, entanglement witness W and the horizontal line represents the hyperplane defined by zero expectation. The state above the hyperplane has a negative expectation and can be detected by W, which forms a high dimensional spherical cap. And the detection capability of this entanglement witness is bounded by the volume ratio of that cap, uh, which is well known that to be exponentially small and can be bounded by an order of e to the minus k. So that completes our proof that any entanglement witness has an exponentially decaying uh, detection capability. And next, we uh, make some simple generalization to multiple but finite entanglement witnesses. We define a set of EWs, and it can be detected, in uh, it can detect entanglement if any of its elements can detect entanglement. So with a union bound, we can see that uh, it still decreases exponentially with k, except there are some uh, log n factor. Uh, however, the union bound does not work if we want to prove infinitely many entanglement witnesses. Uh, so we need to uh, have some new techniques to handle the infinite case. However, uh, I want to emphasize that um, any entanglement state has some corresponding entanglement witness that can detect its entanglement. As a result, if you put all the entanglement witnesses uh, into one set, then this set can, in principle, detect all the entanglement witnesses. This is a trivial case that we do not want to analyze. Uh, so we need a set of infinitely many entanglement witnesses, but not all of them. We did this by defining a parameterized entanglement witnesses. A parameterized entanglement witness is a map M with M real parameters uh, for any theta. M theta is a valid entanglement witness. In this way, we, can, uh, we do not need to analyze all the entanglement witnesses. A state can be detected if there exists some theta that uh, M theta can detect the entanglement and the capability is uh, defined naturally. And here we want to show that our definition is pretty powerful, as many practical entanglement criteria can be written in this form. For example, the positive partial transpose of the PBT criteria. <clears throat> the PBT criteria says that if, uh, if the partial transpose of the state has a negative eigenvalue, uh, sorry, eigenstate, uh, sorry, uh, negative eigenvalue, uh, then rho is entangled. So there exists some state phi that uh, trace phi rho partial transpose phi smaller than zero. So you can written in the uh, right equation of equation 18. Uh, and we know that a state phi can be easily parameterized using 2D parameters. So the PBT criterion is uh, kind of a parameterizing time of witness with 2D parameters. So here is our theorem. Uh, if M is l Lipschitz and normalized, then the detection capability decays uh, at least exponentially with K after K exceeds some uh, certain threshold. And the, th uh, the threshold scales uh, almost linear linearly with the number of parameters. So after K exceeds M, uh, the detection cap capability will uh, very close to zero. So we also have an intuitive figure to show the proof idea. We have three balls in the density matrix uh, space, uh, again, and uh, the inner ball is a separable set. Assume our parameterized entanglement witness can detect all the entanglement outside the middle ball. Uh, to use the theorem for a set of finitely many entanglement witnesses, we choose a set of representative observables. We have four here, O1 to O4. Uh, notice that a representative observable might not be a valid entanglement witness. For example, the O2 here uh, has some intersection with a separable state, so it's not an entanglement witness. However, we can choose those observables so close to an entanglement witness so that uh, the previous theorem still holds, except that we need to modify the constants a little bit. 
and then we can prove that the detected states can be covered by these representative observables. That is, you can see the colored, uh, the detected area can be, can all be colored. And then we bound the size of the representative set and use the previous theorem, and we can prove for this case. Okay, now let's see our main theorem about single copy criteria. The single copy criteria is closely, uh, closely related to experiments. Uh, recall that uh, we are only allowed to measure values like trace O row in our in current experiments. Uh, so uh, what we can do is we select a set of observables O i and we have measurements results R row, uh, R row i that equals to the expectation. So after some classical post-processing, you may know whether the state is entangled or not. So uh, here we define the strongest classical post-processing uh, one can achieve with this information. The basic idea is to show that no separable state can generate the similar results or identical results. Uh, to rigorously define this, we first construct the feasible region re with regard to O and Rho, which are all the states that generate identical results. If you can prove that this uh, set is disjoint from the separable state, we prove that Rho is entangled. Actually determining uh, whether equation 22 holds or not is computationally very, very hard. So most practical entanglement criteria are performed by finding some weaker form of equation 22. The theorem is that any single copy entanglement criteria O with I minus one observables has det uh, detection capability exponentially decays with K. And this looks very similar to the previous theorem, uh, except that uh, we have a minus one there uh, I, I will explain it later. And the proof is very straightforward. We prove that the detection capability uh, of the single copy criteria is bounded by the parameter entanglement witness with n parameters uh, as uh, written here in the equation 24. So here we add uh, the identity observable uh, into that set. So we have n parameters now. Uh, the identity is not required to be measured, so it's kind of free. So the proof idea is that uh, if we only measure the OIs inside the set O, actually we have no information to any other observables that is orthogonal to O. Uh, so M is all the observables that we can predict accurately. We cannot add anything to that. So uh, for those observables that we cannot predict accurately, we can construct some separable state that has uh, arbitrarily small uh, expectation value. And this violates our hypothesis, uh, which that uh, valid entanglement witness should have a positive expectation value for separable states. Okay, that is our proof for the main theorem. And lastly, we numerically examine some entanglement criterion including the purity, feature information, and two uh, moment-based methods. And we can show that they all have exponential decay behavior after uh, K exceeds some threshold. And for the threshold, we also have some numerical experiments, and we found that uh, for three of the uh, criteria, the threshold scales uh, polynomially with D. So we can see that these criteria, uh, th criteria are rather effective but can never be efficiently realized through uh, single copy measurements. Okay, so in conclusion, our work found that there is no good way to detect entanglement in random states with only single copy measurements. And there are some discussions. Uh, we have some numerical results showing that other distributions like thermal states also behave simi uh, similarly, but we have not proved it. Also have analyzed adaptive measurements, which means that the observable can be dependent with the uh, previous measurements results and show that this adaptive measurements has no advantage. Uh, our work may also be helpful for designing more powerful entanglement criteria. At least you need to break one of the hypotheses in our theorems and we can parameterize more entanglement criteria and use my theorem to uh, bond its entanglement detection capability and we can analyze some other properties other than entanglement. And the last point is uh, very interesting, that uh, can we prove if we allow some small false positive errors and a more realistic measurement model? Uh, so here, these two 
things comes together because in our work, we assume that there's no false positive error. So you have to be 100% sure that the state is entangled. So I have to make the measurements deterministic. So uh, you measure once and you get the expectation value. But in real experiments, you can only have some uh, samples. Uh, so if you are very, very unlucky, the expectation value might be biased. And we, cannot, uh, we can never be 100% sure that the entanglement uh, is found. Also, we can, uh, maybe we can find some uh, hierarchy for the entanglement detection. For example, here we prove that uh, using two copy measurements, uh, there is some advantage over one copy of measurements. So if, is there an exponential gap between using three copy and two copy and an exponential gap between using four copies and three copies? So th uh, those are very interesting questions. Okay, here are some references, and that's all for today. Thank you, and now I'm open for questions. Thank you. assumption a little bit so because this is this is like information theoretically of course this is great to do the randomly but like in, in physics very often we don't need we, we are interested in a special subclass of states for example like let's say the the fixed energy subspace of the total system and then try to do, to look at this uh, yes so here uh, I, I think the only in, uh, place I use the pi decay distribution is the second point mm -hmm. is that we prove that if the state follows pi decay distribution, it will concentrate to the center very fast. Okay. So if you can find some other distribution that also has this kind of concentration behavior, uh, in principle, you can use all the techniques we have to ah. prove for it. Oh, very yeah. nice, thank you. All right, any, any other questions from the, from the audience here? here? So I can actually try to. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. So you talked about this measure of how good a witness is, this capacity or capa capability. Uh, well, sorry, I can't hear you so clearly. You, you mentioned this measure of how good a witness is, which is this uh, ca capacity of detection, can be, or capability. So for that, you, you measure sort of the volume of uh, or how much stage you detect, right? How, what, what's the measure on that? What, what do you integrate over, or how do you do it? Uh, sorry, I can't hear you very clearly. Uh, yeah, I think I can help maybe. I think it's about the, how do you define this uh, detection capability. There was, oh. there was a measure that you choose. I think this was, yeah, this one, right? The seven, it, it was there. Uh, uh, the next, next one, I think. Oh yeah, here, the, yeah, the yeah, number the, two. The detection capability is defined yeah. as uh, equation three. Basically, it, it can be defined over all uh, entanglement detection criteria. It's just a successful detection. Yeah, so uh, for the with, uh, internal witness, it's very simple, yeah. But how, sorry, it's about how, what's the distribution of the state row, I guess. Exactly. How, exactly, so, so how do you compute this in practice? Like, wh what measure do you use over the set of states? Is it, uh, for example, for pure states, this can be a higher integral, for example. But for mixed states, how, how is it defined? Uh, are you asking how do I define the uh, distribution of the mixed state? Yeah, uh, so uh, the definition is a K-induced distribution. So uh, we, have a, we have a larger system than the system that we are interested in, and here we have some environment, and the system we are interested in is a, uh, interacting with the environment. So the whole system is in a pure state, randomly, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. But if that's not the case, then let's thank the speaker again.